Hi everyone, my name is Charlie and today I have the Bougie Booktuber tag. I find that difficult to say every time. This tag was created by a book olive and I was tagged by Steve Donahue. According to a book olive's original video, this tag focuses on spending, quality and value when it comes to books. As we know at the moment, and probably since January 2018, I've not been able to buy that many books. It's the reason that my TBR and the amount of unread books on my shelf has managed to reach such a small amount because I've just had to read the books I own rather than going out and buying anything unless I absolutely desperately want that book in my life. And even then I've been get checking the library first. Firstly, what is your average monthly budget for books? I would like to say that I'm actually setting aside money to purchase books, but that's just not the case at the moment. My primary focus at the moment is making sure that I can pay my rent and buy food in. I could probably say that at most I would spend about £20 and that could maybe buy me two hardbacks and a few paperbacks should there be a Waterstones 3 for 2 offer on or I'm purchasing books from the charity shop and I mention purchasing books from the charity shop simply because that has been my primary source for books over the last 18 or so months. Two, what's the most you've ever spent in a bookstore? The most I've ever spent was when I was at university and I went in to buy a ton of books that we'd got on a reading list and so that came to about £50 because I'd sent messages out to everyone I knew who happened to be readers asking whether they had books that I could borrow from that reading list first and then I borrowed all the books that I could, so then I just bought the ones that they didn't have. Are you willing to pay full price for a brand new release, or will you wait until you have a coupon or there's a sale? Now, oftentimes if you go into Waterstones and it's going to be a new release that's popular, they will have an offer on anyway. Um, if you look on the internet, you will usually find it cheaper if you pre-order it off Amazon, but that's not really something I like to do at the moment. I'm tending not to be as supportive of Amazon currently. I'm probably more likely to wait until that book comes into the charity shop as opposed to actually going out and buying a new copy of it. Just because a brand new release, if it's popular, is more likely to come into the charity shop. If I do enjoy that book there, are chances that I may go out and purchase a new copy or indeed purchase another book of theirs should it come down to it. Four, would you rather buy one new book or several used copies? I should have said less expensive there as well. But as I've talked about throughout the entirety of this video so far, at the moment it would definitely have to be, if, indeed, it will always be several inexpensive used copies and this has been the same for me throughout my entire life and it's a very stupid reason and I don't understand why my brain works this way but I don't like to bend the spines on my books. I don't like to damage them in any sort of way. I like them to appear pristine. However, if a book is used, if the spine is already cracked, if the pages are curled, all of that stuff, I feel as though I can, I don't care as much about the cosmetic aspect of that book and I can read that quicker and I, I'm not so tentative with the reading of it. I'm not worried about putting it in my bag and getting it screwed up. So there's that part of it. I'm going to mention my Dickens collection here. I repurchased my entire Dickens collection from the charity shop I work at on Friday. They've just been sat on the shelf in the back and so when I originally bought these, they were all um, only £2 each. And yeah, on the back of this one here, it says 7 99 new. I got the entire set for less than 20 quid. But if I'd been getting all the of these editions of this book, the editions that I like, the Red Spine Vintage editions, it would have cost me 
near or over a hundred pounds. So I was quite happy to purchase the entire collection, even though they're very cheap editions with small print. Some of them were second hand. It made me happier to do that than it would have been to buy them all pristine and new. Besides, I accidentally damaged this one anyway yesterday, bringing it home because my the bag tipped over in the car and it's got caught on something. So I ended up nearly pulling the cover off. So that's fun. Five. What do you think is a reasonable price for a new hardback book, a paperback, an ebook? <sighs> See, this is difficult for me to answer because I know how much it costs to print my own book. I mentioned this one here because it's just beside me. In 2015, it cost £2 to print a 180 page copy of R. Doris, which is why I put six ninety nine on it because I wanted to be able to include postage and I had to include the percentage that bookshops would take off. So I was still making some money back from that. I had to put an extra pound on this book because it ended up costing near three pounds to produce and obviously postage and then the percentage that the bookshops would take off. My most recent book costs £2.50 to print, but then I have to pay the postage on top of that, I have to pay the percentage to the bookshops, and it becomes this big thing. So whilst I'm trying to keep my books as cheap as possible, I do know that if these are expensive, then it must be even more expensive to produce a hardcover. That being said, I wouldn't like to pay more than £15 for a hardcover. If a paperback goes above £10, it makes no sense to me. There are short story collections out there where I thought I must be getting a ton of pages and they've been delivered. The paperback is about 150 pages maybe and that has cost me £10. To me it depends on how many pages I'm getting in the book, it depends on how much I'm going to like this book, in terms of ebooks, though, I think that they should be kept as low as possible. I've seen extortionate amounts for ebooks out there before. Like, they can be more than the cost of the paperback. Like, looking at Amazon once, there was the option to buy a paperback of one book, I can't remember what it was, for £3.70 something, and the ebook was on there for close to £10, and I didn't understand it. It's one of these cases of this is just it's a non-physical item it's digital the whole thing is in the ether to me there is no permanence to an ebook so why should it cost as much as a paperback it makes no sense to me six is a signed book worth more to you how about a first edition if it's an author i particularly like then i do appreciate a signed edition however my most prized possession currently is a copy of A Casual Vacancy that I have signed by J.K. Rowling. And the reason it's a prized possession is because that's a first, that is a reminder of the first time me and a lot of friends that I knew from the internet finally met in person in Bath over one weekend. It was my final weekend of uni. I always talk about the fact that I shouldn't have gone because I had to have all my final pieces for uni submitted the following week. I had barely any money to my name. I went down there, I wasn't the most talkative because, as we all know, Charlie suffers with this mildest case of possible anxiety and has probably spent most of his life being agoraphobic. So I was meeting all of these friends that I'd only ever spoken to on the internet. They probably don't know that it meant so much to me. We were also seeing JK Rowling. It wasn't for Harry Potter, it was for her first release afterwards. I don't think we were actually there for the Harry Potter thing or the connection to JK Rowling that had probably connected us all. I think it was just the fact that we finally got to meet each other. So that's a physical object and a physical memory of that. And whilst I say about not having nostalgia for things, I definitely do have nostalgia for that book and appreciate the memory it brings. However, if it was anybody else, I don't think I'd mind having a signed copy or not. In fact, I just stood in front of J.K. Rowling smiling because the flaming Irish friend went and said, how are you? And that was the only question I could think to ask her. So I just stood there smiling like a flaming pillock.
that is an attachment that I have to that book and that's why I care so much about the fact that I did have that book signed. In terms of a first edition, I think it would actually be nice to just get my hands on one of Shakespeare's first folios. I imagine someone's got one in a loft somewhere and they could just donate it to my shop and I could buy it for tuppence and sell it and make tons and tons of money. Actually, I'm not allowed to do that. We'd have to mention it to head office, they'd get all the money, but you know, I like the idea that I'd be able to do that. Maybe I'll find one in another charity shop that's not mine one day. But yeah, honestly, I don't see the appeal of that anymore because whether it's a first edition or a signed edition, I could still end up hating the book. So, what can you do? Seven, what is your most valuable book, sentimental or actual value? <laughs> Since I've already told that JK Rowling story, I think I'm going to leave that question free. Eight, will you pay more for a cover or edition you like better? Yes, I've done it before, much and more. I know some people prefer the English editions and they tend to be in America, but sometimes I think that the American edition can be better. I have ended up with some rather ugly American editions, but that's because the book came out in America about a year before it came out in the UK and I really wanted to read it, so I paid an extra ton of money just to have it. I have done that. I've scoured the internet looking for hardcover editions of books because unlike other people, I seem to be the only person in the world who likes a hardback. Yeah, so I know, I know that I do, I care a lot about the aesthetic quality of a book. I'm that type of person. I know. And sometimes it's completely meaningless because the interior of the book has been completely terrible and then I regret completely spending that bit more money on a, a book that I didn't end up liking. Which probably is one of the things that contributed to me not buying so many books. Ugh, there are so many books that I want to buy. So many of them. Like, I save all this money because I know that I have an MOT in November and an insurance to pay out in November. And if my car doesn't pass its MOT, then I might not pay for the car to be fixed. I might just buy a new car. And I know I need all the savings there for all these things. But I could just buy all of the books all of the time. If money was no object, I would definitely buy all of the books all of the time. Nine. What physical characteristics does a good quality book have? I appreciate a book with a nice heft to it. I like when the pages are cream and thick. I like a matte cover. I like a dust jacket because I remove the dust jackets. So if anything happens to the actual hardcover, I can cover it up. It's like a mask. So if there's a very nice dust cover, dust jacket around that, great stuff. I'm, it's not going to crack so much. There are some books that are so tightly glued together that they just crease immediately. You don't have to do anything to them. I also like a uniformity in the sizes. I want them to match up on my shelves and it's a shame that some of my favourite books don't do this because I have to find where they'll slot in on my shelves rather than actually have them in alphabetical order like I crave. So that sort of thing really. And oh, apparently I really like blue books has been mentioned on this channel before. I think blue might be my favourite colour. I don't know this, but I'm just thinking it might be because blue is all over the place. 10. If you won the lottery, what bookish things would you do with the money? As aforementioned, I don't particularly like crowds. I don't like cities. And so firstly, without a doubt, I would be quitting my job. Um, sorry about it, but I think anyone would do that. And I know that money isn't eternal and I could easily lose it all in minutes and have to go back to work. But I would focus on my writing and bringing more books out. And I would do that in some hidden away house somewhere. 
preferably near woodland. I would probably turn into the stereotypical horror movie villain locked away in a cabin somewhere. There would be many books in there. There would have to be central heating because I refuse to have fire near my literature. <sighs> Running water, Wi-Fi. And I'd probably build the library that I would like. Uh, which goes into the bonus question. Give us an image, actual or mental, of your dream home library. And I don't want to have shelves that are filled with books that I haven't read. So I think I would still just have to buy books in small batches. But I would have wooden bookcases upon every wall. I would like one of those really grand opulent libraries that is basically an entire mansion in itself. I would like staircases and different landings, um, probably all in some dark wood with vintage lamps because I want it to have this aesthetic as there being almost a body in the library Agatha Christie type situation going on in there. And I'd probably like it to have a door on it that is a vault that only I can get into and that I could secrete myself away in. That's the wrong word. Secret myself away in. And I don't know how big this cabin I want to live in is going to be, so I'm now building some sort of mansion in the woods as I speak. So I'm imagining that it would have to either be underground or I am about to invest in a lot of property with my lottery winnings. Oh my lord, I'm going to end up having to be like Heathcliff in Wuthering Heights, living on the moors away from everybody in a huge house just so that I can have a library that nobody can access. I do like Yorkshire though. I suppose it's a bit of a win-win. I really should just probably start enjoying the company of other people. I mean, it's not that I don't enjoy the company of other people, it's just that people terrify me. I think I am going to leave that there and tag some people. So, I'm going to tag Dane of Dane Reads, Emma of Emma Rose and Books, Charlie of Charlie Brooke, Emily of Novel Novels, Sophie of Redhead Reading, Rachel of Rachel's Reading Corner, Leo of A Little Book Life, Abby of Abby Mac Reads, <sighs> Lily of Lycos Reads, just in case she comes back, and Maria of MH Books. I think I did 10 there, which is double what I'd usually do, and there could even be more than that. Um, because I'm already thinking of other people that could do this tag. So therefore, if you're watching this video, and I haven't mentioned your name, but we talk to each other often, do consider yourself tagged. Maybe ask in the comments. And I'll just say, yes, you're tagged. That sort of thing. There we go. Anyway, that was the bougie booktuber tag. I think I finally said it without getting it wrong for once. And I didn't expect to be talking about my consumerism or my bookish habits on a Sunday morning. But there wasn't much else doing. It's now half past 11. <sighs> if you want to discuss anything I talked about in this video, then please feel free to do so in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this video and until next time, that is all.